The further you go in math, the more fun you'll get to have exploring weird and wacky functions like the floor function, which I'd like to talk to you about today. The floor function goes by many names and is written with many notations. Another common name for it is the greatest integer function, and both of these names do a great job describing the behavior of this function. For a while, the most standard notation for this function was this sort of bracket notation introduced by legendary mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. So this would be one way of writing the floor function evaluated at x. Another common way you'll see in textbooks today is like a sort of double bracket notation, kind of like that with the x inside. But then another very popular way that's more modern is like this. This is how I like to write the floor function. This notation, I think, speaks most closely to the behavior of the function, which is that it rounds the input down to the floor. The output of the greatest integer function is the greatest integer that's less than or equal to the input. And I'll write that out in some more uh, mathy ways in a minute. Why don't we just run through a couple quick examples to make sure that the behavior of this function is clear. So, for example, the floor function of 2.5, this would round 2.5 down to 2. 2 is the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 2.5. Another example would be pi. Plugging pi into the floor function would round pi down to 2. 3. Even if the input is really, really close to the next integer, like 1.999, for example, if you plug that into the floor function, it rounds it down to 1. Now, negatives can be a little tricky for people. For example, the floor function evaluated at negative 2.1. This is not equal to negative 2. Negative 2 isn't less than or equal to negative 2.1. The greatest integer that's less than or equal to negative 2.1 is negative 3. So in this case, rounding down feels a little bit weird, but that's how it works for negatives. It rounds it down to an even bigger negative number. Now, of course, if the number you plug into the floor or greatest integer function already is an integer, then there is no rounding to be done, and the greatest integer function will not change it. For example, the floor function of 4 is 4. The floor function of 72 is 72. In my experience, students usually get a kick out of the floor function. Typically, you wouldn't really encounter it until early on in a calculus class is typically when you would first encounter it. And uh, it definitely catches people's attention because, for one, it has a kind of goofy name. It's strange to have a math function that has like such a mundane name as the floor function just sounds kind of goofy and then for two its behavior is just a lot different from other more well-behaved functions that you would have studied throughout algebra and pre-calculus and geometry i want to go ahead and do a quick graph of the floor function just so you can see how peculiar its behavior is so i'll just put at the top of this graph in let's say orange we're going to graph y equals the floor of x. What does this graph look like? Well, let's start by thinking about what happens when x is near the origin between 0 and 1. These are numbers like 0.1 and 0.2 and 0.3 all the way up to 0.9 once we start getting close to 1. All of those numbers would get rounded down to zero, including zero itself. So if we plug in x equals zero, the output would be zero. And if we plug anything all the way up to one, but not including one, all of those numbers, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so on, all of those are also going to get rounded down to zero. So it starts off as this flat line, but then once we get to one, that, of course, is not going to round down to zero. So we'll just put an open circle there to show that the line that we've drawn here does approach one, but at one, there's a little gap. And right at one, the floor function is going to jump up to y equals one. Because, of course, if we plug x equals one into the floor function, the output would be one. So once we get to x equals one, all of a sudden, we jump up 
to y equals 1. And this behavior will continue. So when we look at the space between x equals 1 and x equals 2, we're thinking about numbers like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.5, 1 1.8. All of those will get rounded down to 1, and so it's just going to stay as this horizontal line, everything being rounded down to 1, right up until we get to x equals 2, where again we'll put an open circle, because right at x equals 2, y, the value of the floor function, is going to jump up to y equals 2. Two. And this is the pattern that the greatest integer function follows. It's just a bunch of horizontal lines, but at every integer value, it has a jump. In the jargon of calculus, these are called jump discontinuities. So that's a quick sketch of the greatest integer function. You can see that it definitely has a peculiar look to it, especially in comparison to your typical polynomial functions that you might be more well acquainted with. Let's look at some more properties of this function. You're probably familiar with the absolute value function, and oftentimes when dealing with absolute value, it can be useful to change an absolute value inequality into an inequality without the absolute value. For example, if I say the absolute value of x is less than 5, that's the same as saying that x is less than 5 but greater than negative 5. These two inequalities are equivalent. I could use either one I prefer, but if I wanted to get rid of the absolute value, I could just use this one. We have a similar thing that we can do for a floor function equation. If we have the equation that the floor of x is equal to m, this is equivalent to a particular inequality. To express that equivalence between things, we use the phrase if and only if. This means that if the thing on the left is true, then the thing on the right is true. But also, if the thing on the right is true, the thing on the left is true. So either bit of information would imply the other. And what we have on the right is that m is less than or equal to x is less than m plus 1. So the floor of x is equal to m if and only if x is at least m and less than m plus 1. This is because, again, the floor of x is the greatest integer that's less than or equal to x. So m would have to be an integer that's less than or equal to x, but if we add 1 to m, that would be the next integer up, and so that would no longer be less than x. Hence, it would be greater than x. So that's one way to change a floor equation into an inequality. Now, of course, if we have stuff in a floor function, that's a little bit trickier than than not having it in a floor function. So it's nice to be able to get rid of the floor function and simplify it as much as possible. One thing to keep in mind is that the floor function, if we evaluate it at some number x plus an integer n, so n here is an integer, then in fact you can just take the n out of the floor function because the floor function is not going to be changed by some integer increase to the input. That is to say, this is the same as the floor of x plus n brought outside of the floor. The behavior of the floor function is really just dependent on the decimal part of the input, and the integer doesn't have a decimal part, so adding an integer inside of the floor function wouldn't do anything. When I say that the behavior of the floor function is determined by the decimal part of the input, I mean, for example, the floor of 2 would not change it at all, but if it had some decimal part, like 2.3, then the floor function would chop that decimal part off. If I think about evaluating the floor function at 2.3 plus 3, having that plus 3 inside the floor function isn't going to have any effect on the floor function chopping the 0.3 off of the 2.3. So I could just as well take the 3 outside of the floor function. Either way, I would end up getting 5. So that's nice to know. If we have an integer being added inside the floor function, we can just take it out. But what if we have two real numbers inside the floor function? What can we say about that? Say we have the floor function of x plus y, where x and y are just any two real numbers. We certainly can't just take either of these things out of the floor function, 
but we can place some bounds on it. The floor of x plus y might not equal the floor of x plus the floor of y, but it is certainly greater than or equal to the floor of x plus the floor of y. This is because if we have x and y inside the floor function, together they might add up to enough to get over the next integer benchmark. You know, if we look at the graph, if I'm in this horizontal line and I add some small number, I might go forward a little bit, but I'm not going to go up at all. But it's possible if the numbers are big enough, we could sh get over that next threshold and get bumped up to 2 instead of being stuck here at 1. However, if we separate the x and y, so we put them each in their own floor function, then their decimal parts don't have the chance to combine to get over that integer benchmark. The difference is at most one. We either are going to get that extra integer bump or we're not. So we can actually also say that this is less than or equal to the floor of x plus the floor of y plus one. In a case where x and y combine to get over the next integer mark, like 2.3 plus 0.8, it would be equal to the thing on the right. But in the case where the decimal parts don't combine to pass the next integer value, like 1.3 and 0.4, for example, it would equal the thing on the left. To write out an example where it equals the expression on the right, we could consider x being 1.9 and y being 0.2. Certainly, this is greater than or equal to what we get when we split them up and put them in their own floor functions. The floor of 1.9 would just be 1, whereas the floor of 0.2 would be 0. And so the thing on the left would just equal 1. Of course, our expression in the middle is equal to 2, because when we add x and y together inside the floor function, they're big enough to get over that next integer bump, and it ends up being 2.1, which the floor rounds down to 2. Of course, this is less than or equal to, in this case it's equal to, what happens when we split them up and then add the 1 ourselves outside. So the floor of 1.9 is 1, plus the floor of 0.2 is 0, plus 1, ends up being 1 plus 1, which of course is Two. One last interesting fact about the floor function we'll look at is what happens if we take the floor of x and add it to the floor of the negation of x. So we're looking at the floor of x plus the floor of negative x. What is this equal to? Well, it turns out there's only two things it can possibly equal. In the case where x is an integer, you may be able to quickly see that this is going to be 0. So it's equal to 0 if x is an integer. This notation, if you're not familiar with it, means that x belongs to the set of integers. This represents all of the integers. So in that case, this sum is going to be 0. Otherwise, if x isn't an integer, well, we can just imagine plugging in a value. Why don't we just do that, and we'll see what it equals. Say we plug in 1.5, the floor of 1.5, plus the floor of negative 1.5, well, let's see, the floor of 1.5, that would get rounded down to 1, but negative 1.5 gets rounded down to negative 2, and so this actually equals negative 1, and that's always going to be the case when x isn't an integer. So when x is not an integer, this is going to have to equal negative 1. We can get a quick look at this fact on a number line. Let's say that's 0, and there's 1, and there's 2, there's negative 1, and there is negative 2. And if we have our number x that's maybe somewhere between 1 and 2, of course, the floor function is going to round it down to 1. However, its negative would be negative 1 and change, and the floor function would round that down to negative 2. The positive number gets rounded down and it is brought closer to 0, so its magnitude decreases. But for the negative number, its magnitude increases because when we round it down, it actually gets 
further from zero. And so when we add them together, the negative dominates and we get negative one. So that's a little look at the floor function. Pretty cute function, shows up in math more than you might expect. It's also closely related to two other neat functions, the ceiling function and the sawtooth function, both of which we will talk about another time. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math videos on the internet. Not infinite if you ain't really in the